This is on assignment. Hey everyone, this is On Assignment. Join us as we go behind the scenes with some of our reporters here at The Voice of America. We'll take you first to Japan, where VOA got a rare look inside one of the world's few fast breeder nuclear reactors. We'll hear about the making of a new documentary about Chinese dissident Ai Weiwei. And we'll find out more about Mormonism, the religion of millions of people, including U.S. presidential hopeful Mitt Romney. It's this and more today as we take you on assignment, so let's go. In Japan, there's an ongoing debate about the best way to obtain safe energy. The nuclear option suffered a setback early last year when an earthquake and tsunami caused a meltdown at Japan's Fukushima power plant. VOA's Steve Herman was given a rare look inside Japan's troubled fast breeder reactor which, according to our On Assignments, Philip Alexio, is not online yet. Let's take a look at that story. Nuclear industry proponents say this fast breeder reactor offers a panacea for resource poor Japan's energy woes. But 25 years and $13 billion after construction began, it has managed to produce electricity for only one hour. The former executive director of the Japan Atomic Energy Agency, Masahiro Kikuchi, says the investment is still worth it. One trillion yen is a small investment over 10 to 20 years, as long as we can achieve something significant for humanity. Steve Herman, you recently visited the Manju reactor in Japan. You talk a little bit about that it's a fast breeder reactor. And I kind of want to understand basically what that is compared to another reactor. Well, this is a technology that's actually been around uh, since the 1950s and uh, had been in experimental use in a number of countries, including the United States. And this type of reactor really has uh, a flexibility that you won't find in the reactors that are in conventional nuclear power plants. It can consume plutonium, so you can get rid of, um, for example, the, the nuclear waste that, that, that comes from other nuclear power plants or even nuclear weapons. Um, it can also be used to generate electricity and it can also make plutonium as well. Scientists believe the fast breeder reactor could create fuel for the country's other reactors, ending the need for imported uranium. It will depend on the results of the testing now underway here and government approval but we are hoping for 100% operation of Manju. What they're planning to do next year is if they get all the, um, the permissions to actually start uh, generating electricity for more than one hour and pump that out onto the grid. Japan, uh, until the uh, Fukushima nuclear accident, was getting about 30% of its uh, electricity from nuclear reactors. And Japan had been on track to up that to about 50% in the next uh, 20 years or so. Although the media continues to focus on the Fukushima accident, things are already calming down, and that trend will continue. I'm confident the silent majority of Japanese who are contemplating the country's energy policy will return to supporting our industry. Anti-nuclear activists contend fast breeders are more dangerous than conventional reactors, and Monju is located adjacent to an earthquake fault. Also worries over the weapons-grade plutonium the reactor can produce. The activists, they have a problem with this particular fast breeder reactor saying that it's more dangerous. Now, what's their argument that this particular fast breeder would be more dangerous than others? Right. Well, they, they point to the accident uh, that happened previously with the leakage of the uh, uh, liquid sodium coolant, which when it comes in contact with air, it explodes. So there was a fire. The second is they believe that if there were to be uh, an, an accident uh, like we had at, at Fukushima, where uh, the, the, the plant is, is basically out of control, that uh, it would be a horrific uh, uh, accidents spreading radiation into the atmosphere along the lines of uh, the uh, atomic bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki in 1945. Japan's in such an unusual country because they are the only country in history to have suffered the effects of a nuclear weapon in wartime. They've 
obviously had these horrible tragedies with uh, nuclear disasters, with the, with the earthquake and so on. What do the people think about nuclear power now? Well, obviously, since March 11th of last year, there's been a tremendous amount of reflection. And for the first time in decades, we've seen substantial numbers of people out on the streets uh, participating in demonstrations. Frankly, I had no interest in nuclear energy. I had never really thought about it before, but because of the crisis, it has got me thinking of how frightening nuclear energy is. Now, the question that is being asked, of course, is it really practical for Japan to scrap all of its nuclear power plants? Because the, Japan, although it's the world's third largest economy, is resource poor. And, and that's what business has been arguing in Japan, that if you phase out these nuclear power plants, then uh, we're going to have to really pay a much higher bill to import uh, fuel to uh, f for conventional power plants, and that's uh, going to hurt the competitiveness of the Japanese economy. Our thanks again to VOA Tokyo correspondent Steve Herman. We'll take a break right now, but coming right up, where do the fortunes of the global middle class go? You're watching On Assignment. The International Monetary Fund says worldwide economic growth is weaker than expected due to continuing economic concerns in Europe and the United States. But some economists say that the sale of non-essential goods and one big item in particular may indicate greater growth ahead. And joining me right now is VOA's Mil Arcega. Mil, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. What is this index, the CAR index? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, the CAR index is essentially a, a measurement of buying power. And, it, and this is important because it would suggest that uh, a certain class of, of uh, people are, have reached a certain financial mobility where they can actually start worrying about things other than food and shelter. Fantastic. Let's take a look at that package and we'll come back to you. Let's do that. Despite forecasts for a slowdown in the global economy, a little known economic indicator is starting to gain traction. The so-called car index is an attempt to measure the world's middle class based on the number of people who own cars. Uri Dadush is head of the Global Economics Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Ownership of cars is going to explode, is exploding at the moment in the developing world, a sign that the middle class is exploding. And the reason that is, is there are about 70 countries with a population of about 3 billion people who are approaching a threshold of income, about 4,000, per capita, where the, the middle class really increases very, very rapidly. Because Dadush says the relative rise in average incomes means greater demand for non-essential goods. Because that's the threshold of income where people begin to have enough to buy all sorts of things. And it so happened that the things that they will buy are the sorts of things that, uh, you know, Japan, Germany, and the United States excel uh, excel at producing. But the IMF says the economic downturn which began in 2008 has also led to reduced consumer spending in developed nations. Managing Director Christine Lagarde says uncertainty over the debt crisis in Europe and the possibility that expiring tax cuts and massive government spending reductions could send the U.S. economy into a tailspin remain the biggest risks to the global economy. We clearly still foresee a gradual recovery. But the global growth that we have forecasted 12 months ago, that we have revisited six months ago, is likely to be yet a little bit weaker than we had anticipated. Add to that rising food prices and increased volatility in the Middle East. And Lagarde says economic growth next year is likely to be slower than the group's earlier forecast of 3.9%. Recent surveys show consumer spending in developing countries has increased three times faster than in advanced economies, with car ownership rising at a sharply higher rate than in developed nations. Milar Sega, VOA News, Washington. That was great. What has changed in terms of gauging uh, success of a society? Uh, 
it's not so much what has changed, is that uh, the measurements in the past have not been accurate. You know, it turns out that measuring the middle class is a lot more subjective than we would like to think. Economists like to think in absolute terms. Uh, GDP grew by 6.7% in China. The euro is worth a buck 29. But it turns out that when you measure the middle class, it's very imperfect. For example, in advanced economies, you measure the middle class by, you know, for example, in the United States, you would, uh, the definition of middle class would be somebody earning about $31,000 a year. Seems reasonable. Yeah. But in some countries, that would be considered very rich. Yeah. Another definition of middle class is anyone who is not poor. And the World Bank suggests that that would be anywhere in the range of $2 and more. So, so a group of economists are trying to come up with another way uh, to measure the middle class. And it turns out that the point at which people can actually afford to buy cars is a point at which they have the financial mobility to actually think about other things other than food and shelter. So that means that there is actually a larger group of, of consumers than we have uh, considered in the past. Thank you, Mill. You're very welcome. Moving on, time for a break. Coming up, a look at the life and faith of Mormons, one of whom is a U.S. presidential candidate. You're watching On Assignment. Well, this year's U.S. presidential campaign has brought into focus one of the country's perhaps least understood religions, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or Mormonism. And it's not the first time that a candidate's religion was a side story to a U.S. presidential election. VOA's Jerome Sokolovsky went to Utah to find out more about how Mormons live. Let's take a look. So, Jerome, for those who don't know much about the Mormon religion, what can you tell us about it? Well, Mormonism started in the early 19th century. A, an American named Joseph Smith uh, reported having visions of God and Jesus and John the Baptist, um, basically telling him about a story about an ancient uh, tribe of Native Americans, Indians, uh, who were visited by Jesus uh, a long, long time ago. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints says the teachings of its 19th century prophet, Joseph Smith, are consistent with the Bible. But Smith's writings de-emphasized original sin and said believers could achieve divine status. Mormon history professor J.B. Hawes says non-Mormons did not like the message. Joseph Smith's work was um, not intentionally, but uh, that it, it ended up being polarizing. Is the gardener home? A historical theme park recreates the lifestyle of Mormons who fled to Utah after Smith's murder in 1844. How do you think you'd sleep on that bed? Jennifer Leeds says some non-Mormons think the church still practices polygamy. They ask how many moms I have, and I respond I only have one, and I also have one dad. The church disavowed polygamy in 1890, but Latter-day Saints, also known as Mormons, hear this kind of thing a lot. They, they were persecuted pretty badly. At the same time, they weren't very kind to some of their enemies. Um, so there, there's quite a history of violence there that ended up with them in Utah. Now, what about now? Do some of those tensions still persist? Yes, uh, fortunately, they're not as violent as they were in the, in the 19th century. But a lot of uh, Christians, especially evangelical Christians, do not even consider Mormons to be Christians. Um, they are trying to convert them just as Mormons go out and uh, proselytize uh, around the world and they spend two years of their their lives going abroad or going around the US uh, trying to bring people to what they consider to be the true faith. Iconic temples, a world-famous choir and clean-cut missionaries sent worldwide by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Salt Lake City. But a visit to suburban Salt Lake shows how members of the church or Mormons live out their faith at home. I wanted to start out today with a game. The Larson family is doing family home evening, a weekly tradition that's not just fun and games. This is in Mosiah, which is in the Book of Mormon. Tammy Larson says family is sacred to Latter-day Saints. So we believe that by being sealed, in, which is like our marriage ceremony in the temple, we will be a family forever, not just till death. The Larsons go every week to church, where even grown-ups attend Sunday school. We've seen the Mormon religion very much in the news recently because of Republican presidential candidate Mitt Romney. So what has 
Romney's candidacy done in terms of bringing the Mormon religion to the forefront of, of uh, the public? Well, it's interesting. It's, this is being called the Mormon moment, uh, mo mostly because of uh, the Romney campaign. Mormons are also an American minority, with six million followers concentrated in the West. Mitt Romney is the closest any of them have come to the presidency. Winder's excited for two reasons. First, Mitt Romney is my grandpa Ned Winder's third cousin, and he's also uh, my grandma Gwen Winder's third cousin on her side. And because it's a milestone for all Latter-day Saints. We've come a long way, and to see a Republican presidential nominee to be a member of the LDS Church really is quite historic for our faith. Winder has written about how U.S. presidents treated Mormons. Their founding prophet, Joseph Smith, actually ran for president in 1844. But many Americans know very little about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and they wonder how its teachings might sway a political leader who is a member of the church. You have to keep in mind that uh, Mormonism is a conservative religion, and so I, the estimate is that about four out of five Mormons are Republicans, and, um, but I also met you know, Obama Romney, so Obama liberals out there mm -hmm. um, who, you know, have their, who actually feel that Mitt Romney is not a true Mormon. I think the problem is that uh, because of the differences between evangelicals, because evangelicals do not consider, many evangelicals at least, do not consider Mormonism to be a truly Christian faith, they're not excited about him like as they would be if, they're, if they were an evangelical candidate or someone they would see as more in tune with their uh, religious views. Thanks to Jerome Sokolovsky, VOA's religion reporter. A new documentary about Chinese dissident Ai Weiwei is now in theaters. Just months after the dissident's year-long probation was lifted, the film is by Alison Clayman. It's called Ai Weiwei Never Sorry, and our Todd Grosshans got the backstory from VOA's Penelope Pulu, who talked to Clayman about Ai Weiwei. Let's take a look. Alison Clayman's film, Ai Weiwei Never Sorry, shows the artist as a proponent of freedom who is digitally connected to the world. <laughs> The film shows how I defy the government by researching the deaths of several thousand schoolchildren in the 2008 Sichuan earthquake and then listing their names. The government had refused to name them. So, so uh, what was Allison's impression of this, uh, of Ai Weiwei? He seems to be a larger than life figure uh, and a huge uh, player now in China who apparently just walks around fearless. I mean, some of the stuff that he gets away with is amazing. Did she, did she talk about that at all? Is oh, yeah. Uh, there were a lot of components in this. The first thing you mentioned about Ai Weiwei is a personality. It's very nice to meet you at last, because obviously I've been following you <laughs> for certain years, so I'm a big fan of your work. There are particular moments and periods which allow a voice to change the way that people think. In some cases, they call him Ai Shen online, you know, sort of holy eye. So he does not distinguish himself as a social activist or an artist. It's, he is both. Mm -hmm. There's no dichotomy, and well, that's exactly the word that Alison Clayman used. Yeah. There is no dichotomy between the two. So that was the first part. The second part was her impression of Chinese uh, policing and government. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, she said that overall, he was free to go wherever he pleased. The only time that they I felt a slight sense of tension yeah. was when he went to the police station uh, in the Chagdu <laughs> province to file a complaint for him being held against his will. I was arrested on April 3rd, 2011, and detained for three months. Although his bail restrictions were lifted in June, he still has not been allowed to leave China. Despite that, he continues to use social media to bring rights issues to light. Clayman says I's activism 
has been contagious. You see all of the people who are really influenced by him and are just as active as him online and they may be, you know, rights lawyers or they may be housewives and they've, you know, never gone abroad. I mean, you don't have to be exposed to, you know, the, the West or to another culture to, to be uh, drawn to these issues of rule of law and transparency and freedom of expression. He's, he's charged now with not paying taxes, is that mm -hmm. right? So uh, what did Clayman say about that? What, is this, a, as far as how she perceives it, is it a bogus charge? Are they just trying to uh, harass Ai Weiwei or? What everybody's saying is that it's more politically motivated than economically motivated, that this is the only way for the Chinese government to stop him from doing what he's doing, to withhold his passport. They're still withholding the passport. So this is the general approach, the general trend. How much of influence is Ai Weiwei having in China? Tremendous, tremendous right. influence in China. Basically, they consider him a god. Yeah, that's a very dangerous description in China. I describe him as a, he's a Beijing band, Andy Warhol. He's a public do you think you're becoming like a brand? Yeah, yeah, I happen to be a brand for liberal thinking and individualism, I think. He's, he really flies in the face of Chinese authority. So I don't know if Clayman addressed this, but does he think that it's because of his celebrity, his iconic status, that he can get away with this? Does he fear for his freedom? He definitely fears for his freedom, and actually there is a little quote even in his film where he says, I'm very afraid. Are you worried? Yes, I am worried, and uh, you know, every day there's people are a sign which tells me I should be worried. And so, Imran, that film we just learned about, Ai Weiwei, Never Sorry, is actually considered to be a contender for an Oscar nomination. That's amazing. It, it really is. Well, we have another story for you now, also from Beijing, where graffiti as art is gaining a following among China's young and fashionable. And graffiti is a new phenomenon in China spread by a small group of young people dropping their so-called graffiti bombs. Shannon Van Sand has the story. Wang Mo is an artist who prefers to work on the surfaces he finds outdoors. If you paint on paper, you have to paint within the boundaries of the paper. But graffiti doesn't obey that. Graffiti means you can paint anywhere that you can see and touch. For young people, graffiti is a limitless form of expression. Wang is one of a small gang of graffiti artists in Beijing. At night, they explore the city to drop what they call graffiti bombs, using spray paint and a public space as a means of self-expression. Wang has been detained three times. After questioning him about the subject of his art, the police have taken away his art supplies and let him go. Wang and his friends are now invited by fashion brands and galleries to take part in promotional events. Even the government has allotted some city walls as official public spaces for graffiti art. But for Wang, these small liberties take away from the meaning of his work. In a country that limits self-expression, these young Chinese are pushing boundaries with cans of paint. Shannon Van Sant for VOA News, Beijing. And with that, we wrap up another edition of VOA on Assignment. On our next show, we'll look at the cause of free speech in Tunisia. We'll also look at what school children in Syria are being taught about the uprising and the long-term health dangers of cooking on open fires in Nigeria. For more on today's program and others, you can check out VOANews.com where you can see all of our episodes. We are also on Facebook and YouTube. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.